Um, so we begin with um, a paper by Shugan Chan Jain on the uh, peculiarities of the yoga system taught in the Gyanarnava of Shubha Chandra. Jai Jinendra, I use this salutation primarily because of the topic that I'm going to discuss. You know, I am going to present this paper more as a student who has studied the text with particular reference for meditation. So I, will, I have listed here the sequence of my presentation here to you for the paper. So first of all, I'll try to talk about Shukchandra himself. Because, you know, in Jain, in Jain literature, the name and the chronology, the time, etc., become highly debatable, and it causes who is first, who is follower, etc., etc. So when we talk of Shukchandra, you know, I took three sources to see how to fit his time. The first I said is, the text itself, because as a matter of practice, all acharyas, they salute their predecessors and the jinnas. So in this text, I find that he has saluted or he has paid respects to Samant Bhadra, Pujyapad, Aklank, and Jinsen. I name them in a chronology because Jinsen belongs to ninth century. So this brings me to the you know, conclusion that he is after ninth century. Then I look at the historical evidence. See, history of Shubchandra says that, you know, his father and grandfather, they were rulers. And somehow when the father was sick, his uncle, you know, tried to usurp the kingdom. So he and his twin brother, Bhratari, they, you know, took, uh, they accepted renunciation and left for practice. And then his younger, youngest brother, Bhoj, who was the ruler of Malwa, you know, the, a religious leader. So these three things indicate, if I go historically, that Bhoj ruled Malwa in the early part of 11th century. And the last I took is the chronology of Jain, Digambar Jain Acharyas in Jain Siddhant Kosh which I think is a highly researched document for Jain texts. So there also, you know, all these things bring me to the conclusion that Shukchandra's time is the early part of 11th century. This is important as I will tell you later on. Then the text, name of the text itself, Gyanar. Gyanar means ocean of knowledge. Most of you scholars know that in Jainism, we spend a lot of time talking about knowledge. Why? Because it's a, it's a you know, attribute of soul only. So when you talk of Gyan, you are talking of actually the soul. And Gyana means ocean of knowledge. So it gives you complete knowledge from a mundane soul and its process up to the liberated soul, the practices, the vows, the philosophy, etc. Some authors call it yogana also. This means that it tell, it emphasizes in details about yoga. And I think he uses almost 20 chapters in the book of 42, talk on the ascetic vows, how an ascetic should live. So he is one, I think, who has tried to put the doctrine and the practice together in a one text. And I, when I read this, I found that it's really a holistic, you know, presentation in which he talks of meditation. And why I say meditation? Because he says the entire process of the path of purification is through meditation. He gives prerequisites to meditation also, but ultimately if you are thinking of liberated soul or getting liberation, then meditation is the tool. 
In Tattva Sutta also he says, Nijjarash Chai. That is, you know, you have to dissociate the karmas. So that's what it is. And why I say holistic? holistic? Because he talks of the four components of meditation here. The meditation itself, the dhyata, that is the one who meditates, dhye, the object on which you meditate or you use for meditation, and the last is the result of meditation. Because we do everything to with certain, certain result in mind. So he talks of all these four components in at greater length with Jain, you know, perspective. The language he uses, Sanskrit language, highly poetic, except one chapter where he talks of dhyata, of object of meditation, dhyay, where, you know, he tries to refute the others, so he uses the textual type of form. And he uses a lot of adjectives to make it interesting for us. I just give you an example that in verse 16 of chapter 4, he says, a human being continues his existence in the transmigration cycle by his auspicious and inauspicious activities. And the example he gives, like a silk comb weaves himself through the web, in the web of silk thread emitted from his own mouth continuously. So he just tries to explain to you, you know, the meaning of trans through examples. Then, you know, he has, when you read the text, he takes an anekantic view of explaining things. And basically, I will say he uses two aspects, the nishchana, the transcendental viewpoint, and the practical viewpoint. For transcendental viewpoint, he starts with the necessity to be a monk, a yogi, he calls. And from practical point of view, he talks of a shravat, that is, who is samyak drashti and who is you know, living a mundane life but is interested in moving. So he, he talks from both the aspects, but the emphasis is more or mostly on the monk, the yogi, he calls it. Now I come to literature prior to his, you know, text. Because sometimes, you know, there is a lot of discussion in academia. He, is, he has, you know, accepted that or some, something like this. So what I saw, I felt is that there are two types, two, two out of the four categories in Digambar text. You know, Digambar texts are classified in four sections. Uh, Prathman Yog, Karnan Yog, Charnan Yog and Dravyanyo, metaphysical, ethical, mathematical, and the history. So this refers to the last two, the first two, the metaphysical and the ethical. So we try to see which are the popular texts and the acharyas he has mentioned who have written in Sanskrit. He does not mention Kunkun, most highly. I feel he may not have known Prakrit or those texts may not be available to him. So, you know, we reviewed all these things and we see some references or some, you know, indebtedness, indebtedness primarily to Samantbhadra, Pujyapad, and uh, Jensen. So, Pujyapad, I particularly say because the commentary he writes on Tatwar Sarva Siddhi, he has taken a lot of concepts, you know, from there. And Samadhi Tantra, his own Samadhi Tantra also, he has taken some, you know, uh, references. And Jinsen, of course, you know, in tant Tantra, when he used Tantric elements, he, he refers to Jinsen. Then there are some other Acharyas. He mentioned only Digambar Acharyas. He does not mention Shwetambar Acharyas, which I think was a custom in general literature. So with this, you know, we come to the Hello. Yes. Now I come to his own. I have a list of references to show, but I will not use this time because of the, you know, limitation of the time here. Then I come to meditation. And here, you know, I find a very peculiar thing when he says meditation generally implies the straining the wandering nature of mind, body, and speech. 
it's not just mind, because you know, in Sanskrit we say chit, vritti, nirod. So he talks of mind, body, and speech, all the three activities. And if we see the Jain literature, we talk of man, vachan, kai, all the three together, you know, to be together. And then he said, to control this so that you can meditate on an entity, something. And then he tries to say, he, he tries to define or bifurcate the meditation into two categories. The first is, he says, that when you have a series of steps or independent, discrete steps, like Ashtang Yoga, Yam, Niyam, you know, Asan, Pranayam, Dharna, Dhyana, and Samadhi, you can do and achieve what you want. But he talks of continuous, that is, you have to practice all of them together. And I will tell you later on that why, how he talks about this thing. So he talks of these meditation then where you have to keep them all together. And there he classifies the meditation into two subtypes. One he calls as unworthy meditation. That is meditation which is not worth pursuing. And here he puts two, two types of meditation, art and drodra, because these cause pain and continue your cycle in tra that transmigratory cycle. And the other he calls vardhi, which is prashast. The word he uses is prashast. And there he talks of dharmdhyan, or the auspicious meditation, or the meritorious meditation, and the pure, the shukla meditation. And in this book, he talks exclusively or exhaustively on dharm dhyan. Why he does it, we'll see later on. And shukla dhyan, the pure meditation, he talks briefly in one out of the 42 chapters. So, and why he says it is important? Because, you know, they result in either merit or helps you attain the ultimate objective. And, you know, he uses a very nice word for this type of meditation. And the word he uses is Saviriya Dhyan. And I was really surprised when I read this word Saviriya Dhyan. Translation, some, some translators call it heroic meditation. But uh, it means that you use the energy of the soul to purify itself, rather than have somebody else help you to purify. And I think this is one of the uniqueness of Jain meditation, the word he coined, Saviriya Dhyan, or the heroic meditation, using the energy of the soul itself to purify. You know, just out of the context, I tell you, I am a Digambar Jain, and I perform puja every day, and one of the couplets that comes to my mind, which I repeat every day, is, uh, I, I can decide it in Hindi, it says, Bhav atap mitavan ko, bhav atap mitavan ki nizme hi chamta samta hai, anjane mene parme ki juti mamta hai. This means to remove the pains of this universe, I have the potential, I have the capability. And out of ignorance, I come to you or to somebody, please help me remove my pain. So these are the, some of the things, you know, which are getting translated into the to, uh, present days pujas. You know, so there are some pujas which are demanding. There are some pujas like this which are self-motivating, you know. Then we come to the next point which he talks about, aim of meditation. What is the, why do we do meditation? So he talks of different, you know, from different views. The first point is, he says, how many types of purusharths, the values are there. And the purusharths are four types, earth, adharm, earth, calm, and moksha. So he says the first three, they keep you revolving in the transmigratory cycle. And the last one, it takes you out. So from this purusharth point of view, moksha is the aim of uh, meditation. Then he says, what does my soul do? How does it manifest? How does my consciousness manifest? So, you know, in general literature, you will see manifestation of consciousness is divided into three categories. 
inauspicious, ashub, auspicious, shub, and the last is shud or pure meditation. When the soul meditates on itself, it forgets everything. So from that he says that pure meditation or shuddha pure is the aim of objective. Until you achieve liberation, shuddha pure is the aim of meditation. And how does he define moksha? You know, usual elimination of pain forever, attainment of the four infinites, things like this. So from all these aspects, he says, moksha is the ultimate objective of meditation. And the state in which you are to attain that objective is also the objective of meditation, shuddha pure. And then, you know, what do other scholars say? Like Kund Kund, he says, Kund Kund Pujapad and Kartike, they say, moksha is the ultimate objective, and which, is, which was tradition before his time. Then, you know, a modern day scholar, Sugani, who is my guru also, he wrote a paper, what is the highest good in Jainism? And there he says, Shuddha Pyog, and Paramatma, Supreme Soul, Siddhatma, and liberation. These are the highest goods. So there also he says that Shuddha Pyog is the highest good. Jina, of course, because Tirthankara is the highest objective, Siddha is later on. So he tries to you know, identify these four and accordingly, it comes to us is that the aim of objective should be, or is according to uh, Shub Chandra's attainment of moksha or a state, you know, manifestation of consciousness in itself, not in anything else. That's the true meditation. Then he talks of practitioner. And there, you know, because uh, he is referring to pure meditation, he says, the pure meditator and the uh, word he uses is yogi. He does not use the word sadhu or muni. He uses the word yogi. And he says the yogi is one who is in the sixth and seventh gunsthan. Now sixth and seventh gunsthan, they are for the monk, okay? So he says you have the a yogi, if he wants to attain moksha or be in the state of shuddha pure, he has to be in the sixth and seventh. So that is his criteria of a dhyata. And this he shows by devoting more than 20 chapters out of 40 on the conduct of the monks. And before that, he writes a chapter on detachment, how to develop detachment. And there, uh, our Jan friends will know, and the scholars will also know, he talks exclusively on the 12 reflections contemplation, varabhavana, uh, anupreksas. So this way he talks continuity that you first become a monk and then think of, you know, doing this thing, not just, you know, I, I'm not a monk and I start practicing pure meditation. So with this, then we talk, talk of the practice or the process. And I will try to like to share some slides which I made for this presentation only. So there are some prerequisites for uh, you uh, to meditate. And the first is that you must become a yogi. Second is, he says, you develop equanimity and restraint of the mental activities. You should practice these things. And then he says, practice austerities. You know, in Jainism austerities, he talks of two types, external and internal. Fasting is a very important activity. And the sec second are internal, where meditation is the fifth one. Before that is the self-study. So he says you should practice all these self, including self-study, so that you can graduate to a meditation properly. After that, he talks about, now, you know, here you see, he is trying to use the some of the elements from Patanjali's you know, Ashtang Yog to uh, make it practical. Because earlier than that, our text used to say, meditate on your soul. How? So he tries to answer how. So he says the first and the most important thing is 
that the ambience where you meditate should be free from disturbances. In Jain Code of Conduct for Monks, we talk of 22 endurances, parishas, you know. That is the physical ailments which you must conquer. Otherwise, I'm meditating, I'm always thinking, oh, it's too cold, oh, the mosquito is biting, or things like this. So he says the ambience should be nice. That means it should not cause physical or mental disturbance. And then he says the place, a better place would be a place where somebody has already attained liberation. Because that ambience, you know, helps you. So like this, he talks all the temple, but the place should be such, which is calm, quiet, and free from people or animal disturbances, so that you can focus, you can meditate you know, on something. Then he talks of postures. Postures not 101, just two in Jainism, as you would see in idols, Padmasan or Kayot Sargon, you know, standing like this. And for us, he says, some people find Padmasan difficult, so they can use Ard Padma, Ard half Padmasan so that they feel their body does not become a hindrance in their meditation. But basically, he talks of two postures, Padmasan and Kayotsar. And then he talks of breathing. So he talks of three types of breathings. One is Purak, inhale deeply. Second is Kumbhak, you know, keep it in, don't let it go. And the third, he says, with a jerk, throw it out. So these are the type of things and then he talks of last, the layers or the mandals, the five layers, which we will see how he uses. But he talks that if you are a yogi, that is you are in the sixth or seventh gunstan, then fourth to sixth, these are not required. You can practice in any place at any you know, posture. These are, he says I'm talking for the beginners, for us from the practical point of view, because you need these, th these things to start meditating. Then, you know, uh, my yoga guru, Chapel, here I read his paper, and he talks of these, all these, in Buddhist meditation and Upanishads. Do I go to the next slide? Yeah. Then he talks with this. Now he comes to the actual practice. And he first talks of dharmdhyan or the meritorious meditation. Okay, I'll just rush through. So he talks of these. The first three are like self-study. And the last, which is the most important, which I want to show an example, is sansthan vichay. Meditating on a form, okay? And the process is, you know, padas, uh, rupas, uh, padas, padas, uh, pindas, padas, rupas, and rupati. So I will take the example of pindas only, the form. And this is the process. You see how he uses the five types, five layers. Contemplate on a vast, quiet, white, milky ocean with a big, lustrous, gold color, lotus with thousand leaves and a central stalk like a mountain of gold yellow. So like this, you know, he always uses lotus. He is creating the cosmos and showing that this is a high place. So you put your soul there. Then he says, now you come to your navel point. Okay, there is a, a lotus there on which alphabets are there. And on top of the alphabet, there are ram or reem emitting flames. And then on the heart, there is a lotus of six leaves or eight leaves each with a karma species and these flames are burning these karmas. So when they are burning, the smoke is rising. Then he talks of air moving, fire, you know, magnifying, burning. Everything is filled with ashes. Then the water drops come, washes them away and nothing is left except the big mountain on which your soul is residing which is similar to an omniscient soul. So he takes through the steps, the entire process, and in this he includes colors, forms, 
and the mandals also. Shukla Dhyan, he talks very briefly. The four types, time is running out, so I will not talk about this. Then, you know, uh, impact on other giant preceptors. Uh, Hemchand is Yog, very prominent, you know, text. And when you read this and compare it to Shukchandra, <coughs> who was 100 years before, 150 years before, you see a lot of similarities. In fact, it appears that Shukchandra's text is in front when he's writing this. Then Tatvanushashan Ramsen, which is like a summary, is also appears to be this. Then my own experience, you know, 12 years ago when I got into this, I joined a five days serious meditation program by Acharya. And now I recollect he was using this completely. And I was a, you know, totally transformed person after that and then jumped into this, these studies. But now, you know, the object of meditation has changed. Okay, he is more for physical wellness and others, and they have diluted. So like this, nowadays, a lot of acharyas are using these things. Now I conclude my session by saying, you know, Subchandra has the authority to talk on uh, dharm dhyan only. He does not talk on meditation because he is capable of that. He might have practiced it. And he said there are acharyas, or they were acharyas in the past, and there are acharyas now also. Then he says moksha. Now in this time era, moksha is not attainable. You know, our uh, scriptures say nobody can attain moksha. So he talks of dhamdhyan only. He does not talk too much on moksha. He says being in state of, you know, auspicious or pure consciousness uh, and progress so that you are ready when the time is opportune so that you can move to the moksha fast. So like this, you know, he talks of so many things. Now I can go on, but I will stop here. I think it's a complete text and a lot more study is needed to understand what is really pure meditation. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention and I'll be perhaps addressing some material that has already been covered and it's not by mistake. And I want to, first of all, thank Shugan for establishing the International School for Jain Studies. And both um, Ellen and myself, Ellen Goff, have benefited from the wisdom of Professor Silgani. And I wanted to just give the narrative about how this paper arose. I was traveling some time ago, I guess about three years ago with ISSJS and I was with Professor Sogani, and about 20 years ago, I started an inquiry into the Panchamaha Bhuttas, and I've been translating and gathering and conversing with people about this, and I sat down with Professor Sogani, and I said, what about the Panchamaha Bhuttas? And he produced his book, and we sat for several hours, and he introduced me to Shubhachandra and Gyanarnava, which was, of course, one of the many texts that is found within the Jain Path of Purification, but I had not had the opportunity to study it before then. And what I'm proposing to do today is to give the big picture about an answer to the question about how this actually fits in with what we call Tantra, and I'll be drawing from some earlier work about from the Haribhadras as the frame for making that uh, perhaps soteriological leap, as we heard about a little bit earlier. So first of all, um, I want to talk about puja and how in the early texts, we don't really hear a lot about puja, but in the Yoga Bindu, which was uh, compiled, written by the early Haribhadra, Haribhadra Virahanka, sixth century figure, there's a long description of doing puja. And I would love to hear from other early descriptions of Jain puja, but in that particular text called the Yoga Bindu, we see this. 
And then in the next Hari Budra, and also I want to point out that this was a shift from the usage of the term yoga, which was never a good word. Uh, in Tavarta Sutra, it's all about a yoga or viyoga, that yoga is the negative process of the jiva being shrouded by karmic residue. And that with this Haribhadra Virahanka, that all of a sudden it's a catch all term for spirituality. And I think in that century, a Gupta type period, there was this ebullient embrace of Patanjali in various forms, or at least the word yoga as a catch all for spiritual practice. Then the next text, which was the first text that I really delved into and, and translated in totality, the Yogadrishti Samuchaya, the next Haribhadra, Haribhadra Yakani Putra, in the eighth century, does really three moves that I'll share with you today. One, he takes the idea of yoga, specifically of an eightfold yoga, and cloaks Jainism within a terminology that is accepting of a yoga spirituality, but steeply critical of, of Tantra. And he actually says that those who think that you can get rid of a burden by engaging the burden, as happens in Tantric ritual, such people are deluded and they're only taking that burden from one shoulder and putting it on the other shoulder. Yet, he actually says that the Tantrikas really do want to be liberated, but they're just misguided. And then he goes into a full embrace of goddess traditions, which were another characteristic that he found quite acceptable. And he retitles and reorganizes and redescribes the spiritual path taking the gunastanas, reordering them in an eightfold process, and giving each of those eight steps a goddess name. Okay, it's a, it's a really remarkable um, subversion on multiple levels and a, a very, very interesting text. Then we go a couple centuries hence, Shubhachandra, 10th century, perhaps 11th, we don't really know, but I, I appreciate uh, the dating that was attempted, and things have changed yet again. And that with Shubhachandra and then his successor, Hemachandra, again switching over from Digambara into Svetambara, we find a full embrace of this technology that is associated with Tantra. So if we think of the earlier embrace of yoga, we see that, and Patanjali, of course, embraced the vratas and retitled them the yamas. And in yoga, we get the strong ethics. We heard about them being presented in the early chapters of the Vigyanarnava. And the other part of yoga is the concentration skills. Savitarka, nirvicharka, savicharva, nirvichara, sabija samadhi, nirvija samadhi. With tantra, we get another layer. It goes beyond ethics and concentration, meditation, into all of the accoutrements of geometry with yantras, of chanting with mantras, with focus, sustained focus on the elements and the whole development of, of mandala. And of course, these elements are perhaps incipient with Patanjali because he does briefly mention japa. He does use the word chakra. The details are not fully built out as they are in the later tantric text with which we are quite familiar. But what I want to distinguish today is sort of a difference between the usages of, of Tantra and start out with a term that's been used by various scholars, including Joel Brereton, that goes all the way back. Um, actually, this is an Upanishadic term, but it translates nicely in the Tantra system, which is a term that emphasizes correlation. And as we know from the Purusha Sukta, the small body is the big body, the microcosm is the macrocosm. 
and it is through this process of higher and higher levels of identification that there is an ascent to the state of cosmic identity. And I've been reflecting recently about the word Atman being about the small within the breath, expanding uh, Burh from you know, the verb root for Brahman is to get really large and that this whole process within the Upanishads is about breathing, meditating in order to make that connection with the cosmos. And thereby, we're returned to some of these very specific details. And in the Gaunarnava, we are given in chapter 29, the listing that's actually the more traditional, almost the traditional listing, but invert it slightly. And then in chapter 37, the list changes again. So let me just review that if we go back to the Markandeya Purana, uh, we find an early accounting of sort of pre-tantric, or by that times perhaps tantric, of Prithvi Dharana, Jal Dharana, Agni Dharana, Vayu Dharana, Akash Dharana. So earth, water, fire, air, space in that order. And in the Hindu literature, that order remains consistent. In also, as was mentioned on the earlier slide, uh, in the Vishuddhi Maga, the Kasana progressive meditation also follows, Buddha Gosha follows the same earth, water, fire, air, and then he does colors and then he does space. But what happens first in chapter 29 of the Ganarnava, Shiva Chandra changes this so that he starts with earth and gives the syllable, the mantra for earth, Lam. He colors the earth with gold, and he says that it is symbolized by a lightning bolt and with the geometry of the square. Then water, Lam, white, and a crescent moon. So you can visualize a crescent moon above a square. Then he does, not fire, but he does wind, and he describes it with a syllable, Yam, and puts a sphere in the middle of the crescent. So you can visualize the square, the crescent, the sphere. And then for him, the crowning in chapter 29 is that on top of that sphere is to be visualized a flame. And the flame brings us full circle back to the illusion to the ayoga of the Tatvarta Sutra that the idea is that the importance of tapas, the importance of the flame, is that it's through the flame that all karmas can be burnt. And the mantra for that is rum, and the color is yellow. And again, we find the, the triangle, the shape of the flame above the sphere. Now, going further into the text, toward the end of the text, and there's a sense of real culmination. And there was, with uh, John Court's article that was invoked earlier by Alexis, this notion that somehow there's not a soteriological leap in, in Jainism, but these two texts, the Yoga Shastra, which draws from the Yanarnava, they certainly put forward moments of soteriological leap. And what I would like to do is to um, switch, as I've already hinted, from this notion of correlationism that is so characteristic of, of Hindu Tantra and even Buddhist Tantra, and say that there is what we in Jain tradition might want to characterize as conflagrationism, okay? That there's this central importance of the burning power of austerity. And I would love to read all of it to you, but um, I'll just say, I'll summarize it, and then I'll read just a couple of shlokas that um, when I came back from India, I got our Sanskrit after, you know, three years ago, that encounter with Dr. Sogani, and I said, give me this text, give me this text, and it was um, just published that year in uh, printed form with a rough English translation, 
and then I found another form with commentary. So we were working from not a perfect text, but um, the original nonetheless. And our group spent about a year working on these two chapters that I've mentioned. And it starts with the conceptualization of karma, okay, um, which is the stuff of earth. Okay, remember in Jainism, karma is substance. And it's characterized as having downward petals and upward petals. So the first element to be invoked is prithivi, the stuff, which is stuff, karmic stuff. And then the second is fire. And the fire is invoked to burn the downward petals and the upward petals. And then the next stage in this progressive meditation is that you breathe and that you invoke pranayam and you breathe with breath of fire and you stir up enough activity so that the heavens themselves become invoked. It's almost like a rain dance fire. And then the monsoon pours down. And as the monsoon pours down, it takes all that leftover ash and crud. And then all of a sudden, you're left cleansed face to face with something you recognize. And what you're left with is the image of the pure, radiant jinna as none other than yourself. The yogi whose practice grows to uninterrupted steadiness in Pitta meditation soon reaches unparalleled auspicious bliss and is called the noble one. He meditates on the glistening whiteness of the new nectar on the full moon, experiencing a moment of blessed omniscience, seated on the golden mountain peak, free from all sensory outflows. He meditates on the self and the universal form on the multitudes of teachers in the three realms, as well as on the inconceivable Lord, that Pindasta meditation what makes one similar to the Jinnah who has crossed the great water to the other shore. Now, this pronouncement, I would suggest, maps to the tantric accomplishment of the transformation of the sadhak into the Siddha, of the Bodhisattva into the Buddha, and from a jiva bound by klishta karma to the jivan mukta. Notably, and perhaps it variants with a text such as the Pradibhijna Pradayam, okay, and I'll return to that, the singularity of the yogi and the autonomous nature of the individual does not disappear. And I'm speaking this to Rahul, who is part of a seminar in Germany on the status of the individual. Okay, so the individual doesn't become incinerated, but rather what's revealed is the unique and particular consciousness of that particular jiva. Yoga Shastra, chapter 7, verse 25, says exactly the same thing. It's virtually a copy, a plagiarism of what Shubha Chandra has said. And in 1212, it says, just as rock gold turns into purified gold by coming in contact with quicksilver, and this is Uli's translation, the self obtains the state of supreme self through meditation with, on that uh, supreme self. Now, my closing yep, is that in Murti Puja, that is Puja in honor of an image, all of the images of the Tirthankara are identical. But as we enter a Jain temple, we see that there are 24 of them. And as we first encounter this, and then as we lead others, as we bring our students into the Jain temple, 
and we explain, well, they all look the same because they're all radiant and they're all pure and they're all free, and there are 24 different ones. And I direct them to look at the throne. And the throne upon which each of the Chitankaras sits in Padmasana, Mahavira has the lion, Parshvanath has the snakes, Adinath has the bull, etc., etc. Hence, drawing from, and uh, Shugen made reference to Shiv Kumar, and this past summer, our group had the good fortune of doing a meditation retreat day with Shiv Kumar Acharya, who has been teaching exactly this meditation for many, many years. And the way that he sort of crafts it is that he directs people to pronounce first the mantra Soham. And he describes, quoting verbatim this text, that you visualize yourself as the purified jinna, as really in the image, as a human being having human form, in the image of the liberated soul. And there's pranayam, again, as directed in the text. And then he has people switch to a koham. And in this meditation, koham, what am I? And I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. But what the meditator is left with is that it's just pure Atman. It's just purely without any attributes. And this brings us back to the original sense of yoga, the yoga, a yoga from the Tattvarta Sutra. That there has to be a release systematic of any object of attachment bringing about the expulsion of all karmas from the soul. I'm going to end with a conversation that um, took place in an earlier Sanskrit translation group. And we had been reading the uh, Pratibhajna Hridayam with a lifelong disciple of Swami Lakshman Ju. And as I think most of you know from that text, which is really considered to be the exquisite condensed expression of Shaiva Tantra, it culminates with Shavoham. And it culminates with similarly, you know, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, but what am I? I am pure consciousness. And the difference with Yanarnava, and the difference with the Jain tradition is that the state of non-duality does not leave an individual without perspective. That there's still a betokening of the specificity of perspective held by particular consciousness by the designation remaining on the throne. So I'd like to put this forward as a challenge of retaining, as the Jains are so good at doing, retaining their unique theology while adopting a technology that by 9th, 10th century India had proved to be very, very successful. A technology that employs mantra, a technology that employs visualization, a technology that employs, in a very particular way, the Pancha Mahabhutas is an object of meditation in order to deliver a person, at least momentarily, into a state of moksha. So, thank you.
my topic today is tantric elements in priksha meditation for some time i had a question how mahapragya the 10th head of therapan sect understood tantra then i found this quotation in his autobiography and where he relates I was surprised when I read Tantra as a means to obtain a state of passionlessness. And this is a quote from Malini Vijayotra Tantra. Sharat Sandhyabra Sankasam Swa Deha Manuchintayan Vita Ragatva Mapnoti Shadbhira Masair Nashansaya hai. Meditating upon one's own body as resembling a rain cloud at dusk in autumn, one is sure to become free from passion within six months. I'm indebted by Jim Malishan to get a insight of Malini Vijayotra and right uh, direction of this translation. So here we can get a reflection or an idea that Mahapragya studied lot more Tantra, Malini Vijayatra Tantra, Siva Sangita, and other religious and Tantric texts. And his views were very positive about it. This paper aims at understanding the role of Tantric elements in the development of Priksha Dhyan formulated by Acharya Mahapragya, an aspect of Priksha meditation which has not been explored. I argue that Mahapragya's Priksha meditation synthesizes Tantric right-hand practices, a modern development in Tantric practices. With element of modern science, in a new approach to meditation. This paper examines the incorporation of tantric techniques such as visualization, verbalization, identification, models of the body, the assignment of colors to various parts of the body, and practice of mantra nyasa. In this system of priksha meditation, all these are incorporated. In particular, it explores that these techniques map on the anthropomorphic representation of the body as a locus of the practices. Today, I will attempt to show how mainstream tantric elements are mirrored in Jain Preksa system, the coiled power kundalini in the internal journey, Antriyatra. Wheel and lotus, most popular in Hindu Tantra, uh, are mirrored at psychic center Chaitanya Kendra Priksha and color visualization Rag Dharana, which is again represented as Leshya Dhyan, the technique of Priksha meditation. I argue that this is an attempt by Mahapragya to develop a new model of meditation that is supported by Tantra and compatible with modern science. Also, it is empirical and free from superstitions and religious dogma. Some of the humanitarian aspects like physical and mental healing is also a taste to Priksha exercises. Now I'm moving, the, what is the idea of Kundalini in Tantra? A key phenomenon in the esoteric physiology of the Tantric Yoga is Kundalini, a power, a force, which is assumed by, uh, as located on the spinal column. It belongs to the, uh, ancient text and the history of this nexus of idea have been stud studied by Professor Alex Sanderson, Olivelli, McVelli, and Haltley, and many more. And some texts 
like Hatha Yoga Pradipika, Siva Sangeeta, present a detailed description of Kundalini and various names. These texts claim that Kundalini can be activated by various prescribed processes. Normally, Kundalini rests dormant in a coiled up form at the lower edge of spine. When it is activated, however, it reaches upward towards the top of the head. This process, which is at the core of tantric path, is characterized as piercing the six wheel, shad chakra bhedan, and sometimes seven chakras or nine chakras. This process is also referred to as moving the vital energy upward by the Shakti Chalan Mudra. Kundalini in Jain literature. Before the discussion of Antar Yatra, it would be better to understand whether any prior practices which are similar to Kundalini exist within the Jaina framework. The term Kundalini is not available in Jain canonical text. However, it is claimed by Mahaprakya to be an ancient idea and equivalent to the fiery radiance Tejulesha or the manifestation or attainment of fiery radiance Tejulabdi which is obtained by developing the fiery body, Teja Sharir, through means of such as ascetic heat, meditation, fasting, asanas, and so on. These powers, when developed, can be utilized both for giving curses and granting boon. Mahapragya 2007, quote from Mahapragya. So here, the Tejo Lesha, Tejo Labdi, and uh, Teja Sharir, very important uh, aspect of Jaina texts, and also in, it is a, they are discussed at great length by Ohira, Wiley, and Flugel, and many other scholars too. Here, Tejo Lesha, Tejo Labdi, and Tejas body. So, how they are connected to Kundalini? He, Mahapragya supported his claim, the Tejo Lesha as Kundalini, on the basis of metaphysical dualism of body and self. He suggests that three bodies, gross body, fiery body, and karmic body, are connected to each other. Furthermore, that awakening of Kundalini is connected with these three bodies, especially with the Tejas body, which is responsible for manifestation or attainment of fiery radiance. The Audaric body is visible, which is activated by Tejas body. The Tejas body is subtle, but driven by the subtle and very subtle karmic body. However, without consciousness, these bodies cannot perform any action. Finally, consciousness is responsible for all changes which occur at the gross or subtle level of the bodies. Mahapragya claimed that Kundalini is the power of consciousness, Chetana Shakti, and very, very similar term is used as Chiti Shakti in Tantra literature for the Kundalini. The vital energy that is available to all living beings uh, being activated through the Tejas body. So this is Mahapragya's comment. From historical point of view, the discussion of the idea of Kundalini as Teju Lesha and uh, the practice similar to Kundalini can be considered in four parts. So the first part is based on the episode of Gosalak mentioned in Bhagavati Sutra chapter 15. This part of Bhagavati Sutra is accepted as the fifth canonical stage during the fifth century CE by Ohira. The second is presented in Hemchandra's Yoga Sastra, and the third part is presented in um, Singh Tilak Suri's 
uh, uh, mantra raj rahasya which is uh, just discussed and also adhyatma kalp uh, 15th century by sundar suri so and the fourth one is formulated in 19th century by acharya mahapragya as antar yatra so these are the four main discussion which are developed or mirrored as kundalini bhagavati relates the gosalak asked mahavira about how he could gain tejo labdi mahavir then instructed him about the procedure of tejo labdi as follow one who eats only one handful of lentils drinks one handful of water practices two days penance takes ascetic heat fast facing the sun with his hands raised above the head at the place of ascetic heat and acquires subtle or vast sankshipt or vast vipul fiery radiance at the end of 6 months the procedure here includes tapas ascetic heat meditation facing the sun in a specific posture there is no information here about channel nadi vital force prana wheel chakra or other tantric ideas the power gosalak acquired by this process is terrific thus the bhagavati records that gosalak killed two ascetics from mahavira sang and also attempted to kill mahavira himself with his power jaini noted this may be one reason why jainism has remained for the most part untouched by the sort of tantric practices which typified many shaivite cults and eventually permeated uh, the buddhist community as well jaini a later discussion of the concept similar to kundalini in hemchandra's yoga shastra in the context of his outline of tantric physiology he mentioned all the three channels which are very popular ida pingla and shushumna the ida resides in the left side of the body and um, pingla resides on the right side of the body abode of sun the shushumna moves in the middle of the body in the spine and the place of liberation these are these are the channels which himchandra used in his yoga shastra but himchandra developed his version of kundalini uh, without using the term kundalini he employs mantra arham which is considered as essential and very important mantra in jaina culture the procedure he employs the five types of sounds mantra arham first uh, uttered in a short sound rush then long sound dirgh then third lengthen three major plut and then sukshma subtle and then finally very subtle excessively subtle ati sukshma these soundings or utterance of arham act act by piercing the notes granthi from the center of the navel to heart to the throat as it moves through the middle path madhya marga yayi along the spine himchandra specifies only three notes as granthi not chakras without naming them noted by question interpret and here the madhya marga Uh, Quaston interprets the term Madhya Margi as Shushumna. In his view, the adoption of tantric element 
anticipated as future advantage in including material familiar to the cultural heritage of the King Kumarpal. Though Hemchand did not use the term Kundalini and Chakra, but it is very, very clear that it is a practice nearby or kind of Kundalini itself. The third discussion of Kundalini is presented in Sundar Suri Adhyatmakal, uh, no, uh, Sing Tilk Suri, 13th century Mantra Raj Rahashe. And here he incorporated Kundalini word first time in the Jain horizon. And also the 15th century Sundar Suri's Adhyatmakal Mudrum or Sardashtav, where he introduced the term Kundalini in a way in the Jain film, it is a Jainization of Hindu tantric concept of Kundalini. During the development of Preksha meditation, Mahapragya coined a new term for the second limb of Preksha meditation, which is referred as internal journey in the eight limbed Preksha system. These eight limbs is our Kayotsarg, Swas Priksha, Sharir Priksha, Chaitanya Kendra Priksha, Leshya Dhyan, Anupriksha, and Bhavana. And this is also a part of my PhD at Savas. The question is why the practice of Antra Yatra was developed as the second limb of Priksha meditation. If we see the literature from 60 to 72, Achari Mahapragya mostly used Anupriksha, Bhavana, and Kayotsarg. But there is no Antriyatra, no existence of Antriyatra. But sometime he talks about Chakra and Kundalini. But here he make it clear. But he defined in a scientific way um, the movement of consciousness in the central nerve system is known as internal journey. He explained that ordinary consciousness in human being is connected with the external world, senses, mind, body, which is the outer journey. The procedure of inter internal journey direct towards the flow of vital energy in upward direction. This is needed to activate the deeper level of consciousness during meditation association with the psychic center and connected with the uh, spinal cord, the pathway of the internal journey. According to Mahapragya, Antra Yatra is placed in the second step of Preksha because it promotes vital energy, which is necessary for the subsequent development of meditational practices. And you know, this Antra Yatra is free from any, any sort of jargon, of any naming. If we see Hat Yoga Pradipika, there are so many names of Kundalini. But Mahapragya used it very simplistic way and the modern physiology rather than esoteric tantric physiology. He claims that the channels of three tantra channels are compatible with the physiology of nerve system. Further, he equates the right channel ida with sympathetic nervous system, then left channel pingala with parasympathetic nervous system, and the final, the middle channel, uh, which is uh, kendriya nadi sansthan, uh, that is sushumna. He explained why this is so significant. The nervous system is a location of knowledge and consciousness. It prevails throughout the body, the core place of consciousness. And this is very important part of the soul, psyche, mind, and senses. And all these uh, chakras, which are used as psychic center in preksha meditation are also located in this place. Further, he explains the upward movement of vital force from the lower psychic center is a way to enter into the world of spirituality. Normally, a human being's energy flow downward and he does not know how to make the flow upward. When the direction change, the internal power 
flow towards the upside. And this is very important. The bhautik sukh, if the energy is downside, then it is giving bhautik sukh, calm sukh. And when the energy changes its direction, it gives adhyatmic sukh, spiritual space. Mahapragya 2004. The explaining the concept of Antri Yatra, Mahapragya based his exposition on Acharang Sutra, which is very important to understand. that these sutras, none of these aphorisms directly support the interpretation of the Antriyatra. In fact, Mahapragya adduces a homology between the concept of Kundalini from the Hatha Yoga and in a way is looking towards the, through the lens of Hatha Yoga. Um, Acharang Sutra uh, used the term Mahaviti, the great path which is commonly translated path of non-violence. This is considered by Mahapragya to refer to Kundalini, drawing upon the Hat Yoga Pradipika. Mahapragya states that there are many synonyms of Kundalini. Among them, great path is one. It is known as Mahapat, and very similar meaning and synonym meaning to the Kundalini. He controversially claims that a great path which is mentioned as uh, Kundalini and he argues uh, how he developed his interpretation and understanding. During the study of Hat Yoga Pradipika, I came across a term Mahapat, which is used for Kundalini. Immediately, I remembered an aphorism from Acharang Sutra, Panaya Vira Mahavihi. Brave men are those who walked on the great path. I did not understand the meaning clearly. The great path means highway, Rajmarg. They walked on the highway as well as on the narrow way, Pagdandi. It is quite clear that the literal meaning of this word, Mahaviti, has its hidden meaning, Sanketic meaning. Here, Mahaviti means Kundalini, the one who walked on the Mahaviti of the spiritual practice is brave. If you look at the book on Tantra, you will find that whose vital force has not moved into Susumna is not free from <coughs> desires. Mahapragya Scott. Within the Jaina tradition, the concept of Kundalini as Mahapath were unknown prior to Mahapragya. These terms do not appear in any of the Jain scripture. Thus, it is likely that Mahapragya drew inspiration from manual of Hindu Tantra and Hatha Yoga, where these concepts features prominently to form the second part of his eight-limbed Priksha meditation. According to Mahapragya, Antri Yatra purifies negative instinct when one is connected with the Kendriya Nadi Sansthan, the path of spiritual development. And this is noted in uh, the article by Quastown and Birch also. Anyone practices, Mahapragya again reinforces it, anyone practicing the deep breathing, uh, the spinal column with concentration and commitment the serenity will experience a vibration of spinal cord because how he experienced and he put his experience on the top of his practices. Going deeper into the practice, he will feel something creeping along the spinal cord. Within this happen, he will feel a strange kind of peace and stillness. The whole body gets cool as if he, he is a hot and tired traveler relaxing under the shadow of a tree. After the practice, just 10 or 15 minutes, the slow breathing will free the mind of thoughts and ambiguities, and he enter a state of no mind, nirvicharata. This is from Mahapragya's own experience. Furthermore, he expounds the another aphorism 
whose general meaning is one who is dispassionate, of, devoid of attachment and aversion, or one who lives in equanimity. Translation from Mahindra Kumar. The term madhyast normally means dispassionate or neutral, and nirjara peksi denotes one who wants to cast karma. Mahaprajna raised a question whether the writer means to refer only the general meaning of this passage and interpretation he considers inadequate. So here again Mahaprajna presents a new interpretation of this aphorism. He argues that the process of shedding karma is the flow of the vital force in Susumana. So this is again very important sutra from Acharang Sutra and this is Mahapragya's new interpretation for supporting Antaryatra. While the main objective of such internal journey is to initiate an upward movement of energy and get benefit of the peace and a change of personality, but Mahapragya never talk about the meeting of any union like Hatha Yoga talks, so there is no such description. And he never talked about any kind of liberating state through the Antaryatra, keeping very simple and uh, using for the uh, common man's practice. These include the cultivation of power of self-restraint, restraint, boosting the vital energy, and the creation of a strong and sound basis for the meditation because mind moves inward. In this way, it enhances the concentration on the object what is to be achieved. In addition to establish the concept of Antaryatra, Mahapragya states that all psychic centers, Chaitanya Kendra, of the body connected with the vital force and linked with the spinal column. As we see similarly in the Hatha Yoga and Tantra, the old chakras are on the spinal cord. So very similar aspect, but side by side, Mahapragya used some more chakras and those chakras are not directly located on the spinal column. The vital energy enters into the brain through the two pathways, inner and outer. So the inner is related to Ida, uh, inner is related to Sushumna, but outer is related to Ida and Pingala. And Mahapragya used the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The vitality and normal strength of the body depends on the inflow of vital energy through the outer channel. The, these activities, he relates the Jain concept of ten pranas located in the body and keeps the organism alive. A special kind of vital force is created in the body when vital force begins to flow into the inner channel. Mahapragya does not explain about the supernatural power of Antaryatra. He approaches the more pragmatic According to Mahaprajna, nervous system is considered to be essential for functioning the conscious activity. It permeates the entire body through the network of nervous system. The spinal cord and brain are the two most important component of the bodily system. The spine extends from the uh, Shakti Kendra, which is the store of energy, and reaching towards the Jnana Kendra, top of the head. Similarly, the sensation and motor nerves are also connected to the radiant head. The practice of Antri. Yes. So, in this way, Mahaprajna used the scientific uh, area to, I think, convince everybody, not for Jain, not for Hindu, not for any religious community, but common man can understand the scientific um, explanation of sympathetic, parasympathetic nerve system and the central nerve system. So in this way, I'm not going in the detail, but just uh, using this picture, he, he used this um, 
Bodhi locus and the old psychic centers are here and side by side he used the glandular system. So according to Mahaprajna, the neuroendocrinology is a very important concept and side by side he used many uh, uh, exercises which are very much helpful for the common masses, for the health related issues and uh, there is uh, a big discussion about uh, various aspect of uh, uh, health related issue through Antaryatra and Psychic Center. But uh, he presented in a very, very uh, simple manner and concluding Mahaprajna has developed Antaryatra through a new interpretation of the Acharan Sutra and modern physiology. It remains very close to the practice of Tantric Kundalini Yoga, but also maps on the center of human nerve system and concept from neuroendocrinology, so which is very important to understand everybody. Thank you. And side by side, yes.